Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 33 is where we're at tonight. Genesis chapter 33. And I've, I've entitled this message Facing the Music because that's kind of what we're going to be looking at tonight. You know, when we look at the Old Testament, um, and we look at some of these folks that we learn about in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges and all the way through the Old Testament, and then into the New Testament, you run into all these different characters, um, people who are really just a hot mess, like just their lives are a mess, the decisions they make are the wrong decisions, they constantly are struggling with problems and constantly struggling with with mistakes that they make. And what I love about that is that as we look at these people and the mistakes that they make and the struggles that they have, it really gives us encouragement, doesn't it? Because most of us probably at times in our lives or maybe most of the time are a hot mess and we make mistakes and we, you know, think to ourselves, how could God ever love me? And so we find great encouragement when we look through the pages of Scripture and find guys like Jacob, who lives up to his name, which is heel catcher or deceiver um, or liar, if you will, and we find him, you know, kind of struggling through. And yet, in this this entire time, as he's struggling through these things, um, God is accepting him. God is calling him out. God is going to use him to not only um, be the the father of the twelve tribes of Israel but also to become the line that would bring the Messiah into the world, which is pretty significant. You know, I mean, if you were um, called out for something that great, of, that, as that, with that great of a responsibility, you would think that you would be some exemplary character. And yet that's not what we find when we look at Jacob. We find a guy who was a mess. And now Jacob is finding himself having to face up to some of his problems. And when I was um, first saved, I remember um, getting saved and being so excited. And yet, you know, I think when, when you get saved, you still have a lot of issues and things that you have to deal with. And the Lord's still working. And, you know, some of those things the Lord works with in a few months and some in a few weeks and some in a few years and some in a few decades. And, you know, you work through those things as you walk the Christian walk. Well, one of the, the major things um, that was pro- a problem for me was that I had this um, enemy, this arch enemy. And, and, you know, we went to school growing up, and um, this guy, you know, just always grated on me. I don't know why. We didn't care for each other too much, but we would, you know, um, be after the same girl and, you know, kind of getting skirmishes and, you know, just always kind of at each other's neck. And um, finally, finally, um, what, what awesome thing happened um, Actually, I was in Albertson's working one night, and I was a bag boy there, and he came in, and we were acquaintances, because we were in a club together, and so I said, hey, what you doing? He's like, oh, you probably don't want to be around me, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal some beer out of the case here, and so you probably want to make yourself scarce, and so anyway, so he um, did, he's, and this was something he did on a regular basis, well, one day, while stealing two cases of beer, he, his MO was he'd grab them out of the cooler and just run for the door. And he's running out the door, and they tackled him, and they busted him. And his, um, his lawyer, his dad got him a lawyer, and his lawyer told him, best for you to get out of, out of state. You know, you find some relatives somewhere else in a, in a state where they don't extradite minors, and, you know, protect yourself until you're 18 so you can get this, because you're, you're going down. They got you on video, you know, doing this, you know, felony charges, whatever. Anyway, so he did. He, he moved to Vegas, which is a safe place for a criminal to be. And um, he was gone, out of my life. And I was just like, that's awesome. You know, rid of Brian. He's no longer in my life. Well, in the meantime, um, I get saved. And um, I, I'm, so I'm a new Christian. And my friend Gordon, he calls me and he says, hey, you want to go play basketball? And I said, yeah, you know, that's great. Let's do it. And so um, I, I um, get there and he's like, oh, by the way, um, I brought Brian. hope you don't mind. He's back in town. I was like, oh, man, I hate that guy. You know, just like so irritated with this guy and um so anyway um we play basketball and then gordon lays on me you know hey sorry i can't uh 
I can't take um, Brian home because I got to work in the morning. Can you take him home? And I was like, oh, yeah, I hate that guy, you know. And so, and here I am a Christian still hating this guy, you know. And so um, I said, fine. So I get him in the car and, and he'd made a comment about my Jesus shirt. I had a Jesus shirt on and he made a comment about it earlier in the day. He said it was cool and I didn't know what that meant. Uh, but then as we get into the car, he's like, so what's with that Jesus shirt? And I said, you know, I'm a Christian. And he said, hey, I just got saved a month ago. And from that moment on, we were best friends. It is funny how God can take you from being arch enemies to being, you know, best friends. And, you know, we start hanging out. And I'd been praying for a Christian friend, you know, um, probably more so than I was praying for bad things to happen to Brian. And so God used the one person in, in my life that I didn't care for to be one of my best friends. And to this day, he's one of my best friends. He's a pastor at, at a church in Pocatello, in fact. Um, and, and I love how God not only can take your arch enemies and make them your best friends, but he also can redeem lives that are on the brink. And Brian and I both had those lives that were kind of on the brink. Um, well, unfortunately, my friend Gordon did not um, like that we were Christians. In fact, it, he was he was kind of irritated that I became a Christian, but kind of tolerating it. But then when Brian became a Christian and me and or Brian and I were hanging out all the time together and talking about Jesus all the time. That was just a little bit too much for Gordon. And so Gordon decided at that moment, you know, or actually probably before that he was an atheist and he didn't want anything to do with us. And so he was kind of, he kind of wrote us off. And so we lost Gordon and Gordon was my best friend at that time. So now Brian's my best friend. My arch enemy is now my best friend. And now my best friend's my enemy almost, you know, it's like Gordon didn't want anything to do with us. And so um, last year, I, I found out that Gordon had moved here in, uh, to CUNA. And so I was like, man, I got to connect with Gordon because I, you know, I, I love that guy and I miss him. And, you know, it's been 22 years since we were friends, but I should probably call him up and, you know, see what he's doing. And so I got a hold of him and said, hey, let's go to lunch. And so I was nervous about that meeting, you know, because here's this guy. I'm like, I got to share Jesus with him, but I know he's an atheist. He hates Jesus. And so what am I going to do? And so we... We sit down at lunch, and I'm, I'm concerned, you know, knots in my stomach, and I'm thinking, how am I going to share Jesus with this guy? And um, as we're talking, he said, yeah, my pastor said, and I was I, I just one of those moments where it's like, what? You know, what? Your pastor's like, are, are you, you go to church, Gordon? He's like, oh, yeah, I go to church in CUNA, you know, and I was like, oh, okay. And I just kind of left it at that, but then I emailed him later, and I said, hey, Gordon, you said you, you have a pastor. Are you a Christian? And he says, yeah, I, I got saved about a year ago. You know, it's just amazing how God can turn everything around. You know, when we think, you know, I, I thought Gordon was probably the last person in the world that would ever be saved, that would ever like me again, you know, if you will. But that's kind of what we're seeing is this this strained relationship, this difficulty. And, and really, it's Jacob's fault. Because Jacob, when he was living with his twin brother back home, um, you know, his mom kind of put him up to some sneaky things. You know, the first thing was he he took advantage of Esau when Esau was, you know, hungry and coming in from the field and feeling like he was going to die. And he basically said, hey, I'll, I'll give you a bowl of soup if you give me your birthright. And so, of course, Esau, despising this great honor that he'd been given, that he would be the heir to the Messiah, sells it off like it's something cheap for a bowl of soup. But then later, um, Jacob's mother put him up to deceiving their, his father to steal not only the birthright, but then the blessing. And so um, Esau, his, his kind of his last thing was, I am not going, I, I'm going to wait till my father is died and we're done mourning for him. And then I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. And of course, Rebecca seeing this, his mother, she was like, you know, we got to send him away. And so she says, I will send you away for a few days to my, my brother Laban. You go hang out with him for a few days. And when things have cooled off, when your brother has cooled off, I will send for you. And so we know the story. He runs off um, to, to go find Laban. On the way, he has a vision of God and the ladder ascending and angels ascending and descending on this ladder. And... Jacob kind of finds God there, makes promises to God. God makes promises to him. And then he goes off to Laban and he's there for 20 years. And in the process of that 20 years, he gets married. Of course, he, he's trying to marry Rachel. And, you know, it's um, 
what he feels like is Rachel, but when he wakes up, it's not Rachel, it's Leah, right? Kind of got tricked the same way he tricked his dad. And then he works another seven years for his wife, Rachel, and then he gets two handmaidens, his wife, and so he ends up with, he wanted one woman. He ends up with four women and um, all these kids, you know, that are 11 kids by the time they're leaving um, that place. And, and they had to sneak out in the middle of the night to run from Laban because of, you know, basically he's being taken advantage of. And God says, move out of there. So he, he's running from Laban and Laban catches up to him and says, why are you stealing away my children and my, my daughters? And, you know, you've done me wrong. And he has to work things out with Laban. And they, they, he does, and, and he leaves from there. But then he has to face Esau. And so that's what we saw last time as he's getting ready to face Esau. He's just really anxious. This brother who he deceived, he was supposed to be called for in a couple of days. It's been 20 years since he did this to his brother Esau. And rather than him forgiving, you know, for, for all he knows, bitterness has risen up and bitterness has come forward. And so he sends some men a, a, a in front of him and says, hey, go tell my brother Esau that I'm coming. And they come back and they say, oh yeah, he's coming to see you too. And he has 400 men with him. And so this stresses Jacob out to the max. And so he sets everybody up in, in these companies and, and he sends out droves to, to Esau and um, you know money upon money as, as Esau's coming to he's going to reach these but in the middle of the night as he's waiting for Esau to come he separates himself from everybody and it is really strange but it says that a man wrestled with him until daybreak and and you know just a bizarre situation. You know, this, he's in the middle of the dark by himself, and this guy grabs him and starts to wrestle with him. And as he's wrestling this guy, trying to trying to pin the guy, I guess I don't know. Um, he, the guy says, "Give up," and he's like, "No, I won't give up." And the guy touches his hip, and he dislocates it, and he says, "You know, it's, the day is breaking." And he says, "Let go," and he says, "I won't let go until you bless me." And so he blesses him and, and he says, you know, you've wrestled with man and you've wrestled with God and you've prevailed. And he asks the angel of the Lord, what is your name? And he says, I won't tell you. He didn't tell him. And so um, Jacob comes out limping, limping um, where God had touched him. And, and basically um, he, he says, man, I've seen God face to face and lived. You know, he sees that as a, a pretty um, monumental moment in his life. And so he comes out limping and now getting ready to face his brother so in verse 1 of chapter 33 it says now jacob lifted his eyes and looked and there esau was coming with him and with him were 400 men now it's it's pretty that's got to be a pretty scary thing why would esau be coming with 400 men i mean can you think of any reasons why he'd come with 400 men welcoming party <laughs> no the only reason you could think that he would come with 400 men is that he's angry and either he feels like jacob's coming to attack him or he is going to attack jacob now as he's coming to jacob we know that he he met at least you know three droves several droves of you know different animals and and as he came to them the, the men were instructed to say this is a gift for you from your servant jacob and he is behind us, and he, he, so he's met these successive droves of gifts that Jacob has given to him to hopefully soften him up, and now he's coming. You know, I, I think about that often. You know, is there any, anything you've ever done in your life that you wish you could take back? Any words that you've ever said that you wish you could, you know, pull back and, and not say them, unsay them? You know, and, and it's crazy how those things kind of twist our lives up, don't they? You know, you think about the, the regrets you have in life. And yet what's amazing to me is no matter how many things we've done, it doesn't matter how messed up we are, when we come to Jesus, how quickly He can fix and mend those things. But often it takes us facing them before he fixes them you know we have to face them oftentimes 
You know, I remember talking to a guy one time and I was, you know, he was repenting, coming back to the Lord. He'd, he'd um, you know, served the Lord for a while and then kind of um, fallen off the wagon and he kind of gotten back into some pretty serious sin. And he's like, Mike, you just don't understand all the things I've done and, you know, such a ba- I've been such a bad witness to all the people at work and every you know everyone around me and they've they've watched me and they you know I was a Christian and then I was you know hanging out with them and drinking and gambling and all kinds of stuff and and now what am I now I I'm a liar you know I'm basically I'm just a fool and I and I just told him I said you know what you don't have to worry about that you have to just let God worry about that you know you just go and face the music you just go apologize and tell him hey you know, I apologize to you guys. You know, I really love the Lord and I've been kind of living other than that. And I, I, I just want to say sorry. And, you know, it was amazing how quickly the Lord took him from, you know, backslidden to back in, in the good graces of his, of his bosses and stuff where they respected him again as a Christian. You know, and, and it, was, it was miraculous. He told me later, he's like, man, it's just so cool the way the Lord just worked all that out. You know, I didn't have to really do anything other than just own it. And, and really, that's what is happening here. Now, now, Jacob is told, he's instructed by God to go back home, but he knows, I'm going to have to own this. So it says, and then, you know, he sees Laban come in this big crowd of people, so he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah with her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. So those he loves most, he puts last, you know, and, and so what is he saying? You know, is, is it because he wants, you know, if there's a slaughter coming, maybe the ones in back will get away, <laughs> you know, it's kind of sad. Or maybe he's saying, you know, I want, I want the reveal to be, you know, least to the greatest. I don't know. But whatever the case is, whatever his motives are, um, he does it this way. But then notice this, it says, Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Now, it's, it's very likely that his brother has settled in the land of Edom and is considered, I mean, he has 400 men with him, he has an army with him, he's considered a king at this time of Edom, and he will be the father of the people of Edom. And so um, here comes... Esau with these 400 men and it was customary in that day that if you were in the presence of a king that you would bow seven times ancient codes tell us this that they, you bow seven times before a king and so he bows seven times showing honor to his his brother and what, what I love about this is that it tells us that Jacob who before and before he wrestled with God remember he set one company up here one company um, behind them, and then he went across the river and with his wives and his children, and he and then he put them over to the other side of the brook, and he went off by himself. And so it's almost like when Esau gets here and attacks that first group, then the second group will get away, and my wife and I will be able to get away. You know, so he, it's kind of cowardly. But now he's holding his ground. Esau's coming. He sent out these gifts. And, and he goes out to meet his brother. And that's pretty, that's pretty bold. You know, he, he could have ran away, which it almost seems like he was trying to do. But now he comes out and he faces his brother. And it says, But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Have you ever felt that way? Like you're angry with somebody and then when you see them, Instead of hitting them or yelling at them or whatever you, you know, your, your heart is broken for them. You know, one time my wife and I were, um, we, we had witnessed to somebody in her family. We had talked to them about Jesus and they're not, they weren't a Christian. And one of her relatives found out about this, um, this moment where we'd witnessed to her relative, other relative. And they were very angry with us. And so they pulled us into their house. And they were screaming at us, I mean, for hour, a couple hours straight. They were just yelling at us and calling us names and telling us how horrible we were and everything for talking to this other relative about Jesus. And, you know, we were just, like, blown away by it. You know, just it was one of those intense moments in life. And um, 
we left and my wife is just bawling. She's just like, you know, sobbing. And she says, we have to go back. We, ha- we can't leave it like that. We have to go back. And I was like, are you crazy? You know, I, I was surprised we didn't get punched or I didn't get punched at least. You know, are you crazy? You're going to go back to their house and knock on their door. And so I was like, okay. So we drove around to the end of the street and we turned around and went back and I knocked on the door and I'm like, man, he's just going to open the door and punch me in the face. This is what I was, I was expecting, you know? And so he opens up the door and my wife is like, we can't do it like this. You know, we, you know, we love you guys. And, and this is what he said. This is the funniest thing I've ever heard anybody say in my life. He said, I can't believe you guys are so nice and you're Christians. <laughs> I mean, would you think that Christians are supposed to be evil? I guess, I don't know. I mean, from some people's perspective, I suppose we are. But, you know, um, it's amazing how sometimes... When you're when you face somebody who you you just want to beat them up, you want to be angry at them, you want, but when you see them, because deep inside you love them, you just fall apart. You know, think about it. You you know your kid goes astray. You're so frustrated with them. You you want to wring their neck, and if I see him, I'm going to tell him this, and I maybe even you know told yourself that I'm going to tell him this, and I'm going to tell him that, and I'm going to tell him the other thing, and then you see him and you just melt. You know. Because you love him. You know, it, there's a guy who was at the pastor's conference. His name is Travis, but he went by Thistle because he's like a Thistle, I think, because he's a rapper. But he was sharing how, you know, his dad had just kind of estranged him. He's like, you know, I don't want anything to do with you. And he was just a kid, a little kid, but he'd stole his dad, he'd stolen his dad's gun. He was into drugs and stuff. He'd stolen his dad's gun. And um, he went home to, to face the music, and his dad basically said, you know, you stole my gun. Where's my gun? He's like, I don't know. It's gone. It's, you know, I lost it. He said, and he he said he was just waiting for his dad to say, you know, it's okay. You know, I love you. You know, I forgive you. And instead, his dad was like, you know, get out of my house. I don't want you here anymore. And he's just broken about it. And so he left. And he's like, I don't need my dad. I don't care about him anymore. And and then he gets saved, and he comes back into his dad's life, and. um his dad didn't tell him that he'd gotten sick and he was in the hospital. And so as he's driving, he's, he's driving with his mom to the hospital to go see his dad. He's like, I'm going to punch him in the head. I'm going to, you know, he's like telling him all this stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to hit him. You know, I'm so mad at him. You know, I'm just going to beat him up or something like that. And he gets to the hospital and all he did was cry and fall into his arms and say, dad, I love you. You know, but it's, it, that's the way it is when you really love somebody. And, and Jacob and Esau, you have to realize these guys, when Jacob had deceived Esau, they were at least 40 years old. So they'd grown up together. You know, they played out, out in, the, in the weeds. You know, I think of my two eight-year-old boys. You know, they're playing together and hanging out together. And, you know, if they were to be mad at each other, you know, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't last, you know. And so Esau, softened by the gift maybe, maybe when he saw Jacob, he was softened. But it says he ran and kissed him and they wept. And I can just imagine Esau coming to kill Jacob. Verse 5, it says, And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. And, and he has that right, doesn't he? You know, God gives us everything. You know, nothing that we have is because of, we were good enough. I mean, think about it. God gave you the ability to walk. He gave you the ability to run. He gave you the ability to breathe. He gave you the ability to think. You know, everything we have has been given by God. And he, so he acknowledges God in this. And you'll see Esau does not. As, as he talks with Jacob, he doesn't acknowledge God. But J- Jacob does acknowledge God in everything. Verse 6, Then the, ma- then the maidservants came near and their children, and bowed down, so basically the least to the greatest. And, and Leah also came near with her children, and bowed down. Afterwards, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Now it's interesting, because you think about Jacob and his four wives, and the children that they have, and of course, um, Rachel was, was the one that Jacob loved. She was the one that he adored. And yet, it would be Leah that he would have buried with him. You know, he'd be buried where Leah was. And, and Leah would be the one through whom 
the Messiah would come. Um, her, her son Judah would be the one through whom the line of Christ would come. As you think about this, you know, when Jacob went into that tent, intending on marrying Rachel and finding in the morning that it was Leah, um, you kind of wonder, was it Laban or was it God <laughs> who, who, who pulled the switcheroo on Jacob? But he brings them in, in the, in the order that he values them. They bow down before Esau. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in your sight, my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And so he's, he's seen this gift. I mean, it was hundreds of, of animals. You know, milk camels and goats and all these things coming before Esau. And he's seen all of them. And it's great wealth. I mean, anybody who had that much wealth, you know, that would be a lot. And yet he says, I have enough. I don't, I don't want it. I don't need it. Keep it for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please. If I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I have seen the face of God and you were pleased with me. And so um, the idea behind this is that if Esau takes this gift, He's saying, I forgive you. If he doesn't take the gift, and you, you remember we saw that with Abimelech earlier, you know, with Abraham and with Isaac both. Um, they kind of made treaties with each other and gave each other animals. And that was basically a peace offering. Hey, I'm going to give you these animals. And, you know, and you're not going to mess with me and I'm not going to mess with you. We have a, a treaty between one another. And that's what Jacob is trying to establish is this treaty between him and his brother. If his brother does not take this gift, he is basically saying, no, um, you keep it yourself because I'm going to come in the middle of the night and I'm going to kill you for what you've done. And so it's a pretty serious th- situation. Um, now, it is true that when somebody gives you a gift in the Middle East, and I don't know how the cultures have carried forward since then, but nowadays if somebody were to give you something, you would always refuse it. It would be considered impolite to receive um, something from someone because it's too forward. Now, um, let's say that you visit Saudi Arabia, you know, and, and you're sitting in a, a tent of a, a, you know, a Bedouin has a, you know, tent out and he asks you if you want a cup of coffee. You would never say yes. You would always say, oh, no, thank you. And then he, he would ask you again, do you want a cup of coffee? Just like your kids do. You know, can I have it? Can I have it? You know, he asks you again. He'll ask you four times. And on the fourth no, he'll serve your coffee. You never said yes. He serves your coffee. You say, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Then he serves coffee and you drink coffee together. Why? Well, because by saying yes, you'd be saying, yes, I, you deserve, I deserve it. You should serve me. You know, you're lower than me. By saying no, you're saying I'm not worthy to receive your hospitality. So how do you not get a cup of coffee? What if you don't drink coffee? How do you not get the cup of coffee? You say, oh, thank you. No, we will, ser- we will share a cup another time. That's how you refuse. But it's, it's just the way that their culture is. You know, you always refuse the gift at first. And so too it could be in this case. You know, same thing when, remember when um, Abraham's trying to build the, or buy, buy the field from the sons of Heth? And he says, you know, how much is the field? And he says, oh, you know, what's the little bit between you and me? It's only worth $400. I'll just give it to you. You know, 400 shekels, I'll just give it to you. He's like, okay. And so he pays him out 400 shekels and he received it. He's not going to tell him, you should pay me. But it's, it's just kind of this dance that they do. And they still do this in the Middle East. You know, they still negotiate. They still, you know, basically everything's a bargain. If you go to Israel and you don't talk them down, They'll be offended, you know, I've heard. I've never been there, but I've heard. They'll be offended because it's kind of the thing that they do. You know, you're not supposed to pay the price that they quote you. You've got to work them down. So that could be what's happening here. But anyway, he, he says, um, you know, I'm, I don't need it. And he says, please, you know, I've seen, as, as seeing your face is like seeing the face of God. You know, and, and Jacob knows a little bit about that, doesn't he? You know, his, his hip's still hurting him. As he's, hip, as he's limping with his hip out of joint. He's saying, I've seen your face. And really, what he's saying is, I, 
I just saw God and I found favor in his sight. He was a blessing to me. You coming and not killing me has been a blessing to me. Seeing your face is like seeing God's face. And so I think he means this pretty almost literally. In verse 11, it says, Please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. So he urged him and he took it. Now, earlier Esau said, I have enough, which means I have much. That's, that's what the literal Hebrew word means. I have much. But when Jacob says, God has graciously blessed me, his word for enough doesn't mean just enough. It means I have everything. I am full. I, have, I, I am in need of nothing. And, and I think that that's in a sense true. Tozer said that when we have God, we have all things in one. You know, and I think that that is a mystery to us. And yet when we experience that, when we experience intimacy with God and we have experienced God in our lives, we realize, as Corey Ten Boone said so perfectly, you never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And she would know, you know, spending her time in Ravenbrook and being without. You know, that's, that's what he's saying in a sense. You know, I have everything. I, I, I don't need anything. God provides everything. You know, and it, it goes along with the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You know, and that's, that should be what the life of the Christian is all about. Being in that place where God is meeting your every need, where God is your all in all, where He is satisfying not only your, your needs, but satisfies your soul. Because intimacy with God is what we were created for. That's why God created us, is, is to know Him. And to have fellowship with Him, or as the Creed says, to enjoy Him forever. That's the chief end of man, is to know God and to enjoy Him forever. And so too, for us, when we know God, we find in His presence is fullness of joy and at His right hand pleasures forevermore. That if I delight myself in the Lord, He gives me the desires of my heart. And so to be in proximity to God, is, is to have God in your life and fulfilling you in ways that you didn't even realize you needed fulfilling. And I, I love that Moses, in the account of um, that where God passed before him, he says, you know, since I know you and have found grace in your sight, let me see your glory that I might know you and find grace in your sight. That he would... I know you, so I want to know you more. I know you, so I want to see who you really are. And and to have a manifestation of God in his life was probably the most fulfilling thing that Moses knew he could could ever experience. Now you remember Jacob just a chapter ago in in Genesis 32, 9. It says, Then Jacob said, O God, my father... O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and your family and I will deal well with you. Notice what he says, I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I've become two companies. He, he's saying, I, I, all I had was the clothes on my back and this stick. And I still have the stick, but now I have herds and camels and donkeys and people and servants and this two huge companies of people that you've turned me into from a guy with a stick and now I have all of this and that's when he says deliver me I pray from the hand of my brother from the hand of Esau for I fear him lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children for you said I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered for multitude and so He's afraid, but what's beautiful about this is as he's afraid, um, he turns from his scheming, which is always where he was, to scheme and figure things out, and he turns to God, and he's honest with God and says, 
these, this is what you've promised me, and this is what I'm afraid of, and so please deliver me. In Genesis 32, verse 28 is where God, after God had wrestled with him, he says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And so Jacob is very aware that not only has God given him all of this, he started with nothing, but God has also given him victory. You know, not only with, not only favor with man, but also favor with God. He's been blessed. It says, verse 12, Then Esau said, Let us take our journey. Let us go, and I will go before you. So Esau accepts his gift. Okay, I'll take it, which is probably a relief to Esau. And he says, So I'll go with you. I have all these 400 guys. I can help you along the way. But Jacob, verse 13, said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Now, um, <laughs> this is true, probably. Because if you remember, they were midnight movers leaving um, Laban's house, right? They left, as Laban was going that way, taking a three-day journey, they left in the middle of the night going the other way. And so he's driven his flocks and he's driven his children and he's pushed them to go as fast and as far as they can um, and so th- no doubt they're worn out. And when you're moving a large company like this, you can't move very many miles a day. You know, probably on average about five miles a day. You push them much farther, much harder than that. And then you start to wear your animals out. You start to wear um, your kids out. And, you're, you know, it's just, it just becomes a dangerous situation. You know, if you've you ever read any stories of the pioneers coming from back east all the way to the west you you read about how they you know struggled and people died along the way all the time because if they tried to push too hard you know it just was too hard on on the week and so they kind of got to keep this slow pace you know and he's saying hey we've already been driving really hard you know we can't do this if they drive them hard one day then we're going to lose some animals here now part of that's true but part of it he probably has some ulterior motives Verse 14, he says, Please let my Lord go on ahead. Um, Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. Now, it's interesting because Seir is in the land of Edom. It's not in the land of Canaan. And God told him where to go where? Back to the land of Canaan. And so he's telling him, I'm going to go, I'll meet you there in Seir. Um, some people see this as a prophecy that Jacob is saying, you know, I'm going to flee to Seir, finally get there. And, and he will, you know, um, in, in the last days we know from biblical prophecy that when the abomination of the desolation takes place, that the children of Israel will flee to the land of Seir. They'll flee to Petra or to Edom um, for safety. And so some people see that as a prophecy. I don't know, that might be a stretch. But Jacob has no intention of making it this time. This isn't where he's headed. This isn't where he's going. And so verse 15, it says, And Esau said, Now let me leave with some of the people, who, or let me leave um, you with some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So he's still probably concerned about Esau's intentions. Does Esau really love me, you know, he's going to accept my offer and then he's still going to kill me. You know, Esau, the Bible tells us, was a profane man. We, you know, we don't know what he's capable of. And, and obviously Jacob doesn't trust him. You know, as Esau changed, you know, he fell on his neck, kissed him and wept. We don't know. You know, we don't know. But in a sense, it's probably good that he didn't yoke himself to Esau. You know, he didn't stay with Esau. Because what would that have meant for him? You know, I mean, I, I think it's it's important to, uh, for even us as Christians. The Bible tells us, do not yoke yourself together with a non-believer. You know, you, you don't want to fall into contract with somebody who's a non-believer. Why? Well, because that person is going in a different direction in life than you are. That doesn't mean you can't be friends with a non-believer, but it, it means you're not supposed to attach yourself to them through contract, through business, through marriage. And so... Um, 
you know, probably good that he didn't go with his brother Esau, especially as much honor as he's giving that him. Because remember, it always it said in the prophecies that the the older will serve the younger, and so it, it's it's designed by God that Esau would serve Jacob, and so this is the opposite. What's happening here is the opposite of what God had said is how it's supposed to be. And so verse 16, it says, So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Succoth. So Esau, if you could look at a map, you see Esau goes southeast towards Jordan, and Jacob goes north up to Jabok, um, north of Jabok, where he wrestled with God. He goes back the opposite direction he came and stays in Succoth. And notice this. Um, verse 18, a, or excuse me, verse 17 still, he says, built himself a house and made booths for his livestock there. Um, uh, livestock, therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth or Booths. So he finds himself this place, whether it was named anything at the time or not. He builds himself, what did he build himself? A house. Now, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. But there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, it's not in the land of Canaan. It's across the Jordan from the land of Canaan. And it's also a house. Remember in Genesis chapter 31, verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to the family, and I will be with you. He's supposed to be returning to Isaac's house. To Isaac's, no, not Isaac's house. Isaac's what? Isaac's tent. Yeah, because remember, Abraham didn't build a house. He lived in tents because he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God, right? And Isaac lived in tents. And so now Jacob, outside of the land of Canaan, <laughs> outside of the pattern of his fathers, builds himself a house in Succoth. You know, I, I think it's interesting how God could have this plan for us. And, and, and you know, we, we hear God's voice and he says, this is what I want for you. And how easily it is for us to decide, you know, that seems too difficult or that seems impossible or that seems, you know, unimaginable even. I think I'm just going to go with what I know. What makes sense to me? What would be easy for me? You know, no doubt it's easier to build yourself some stables and to live in a house than it is to keep rallying your herds around and live in a tent. You know, how many of you guys would prefer living in a tent than a house? <laughs> Maybe for a week. You know, we do that. We go up in the mountains. We decide to see what it's like roughing it for a while. But after a while, you kind of like, you know, indoor plumbing. <laughs> you like the conveniences of a couch and a, you know, comfy place to sleep and, you know, not bugs fly, you know, and smell like smoke all the time. You know, it's, it's, it's convenient. And so he finds this convenience and, and whatever... And what's amazing to me is that he will spend eight to ten years, you know, we just know because of the ages it gives us for his children, he spends eight to ten years in Succoth before he finally obeys God. And yet this is what's interesting. You know, we make a lot of mistakes. And yet in the book of Hebrews, it tells us in chapter 10 that our... Well, is it in chapter... Actually, no, I'm thinking of something else, but... Um, Actually, I think it's in Romans. I'm getting two passages mixed up. But anywhere, somewhere in the Bible it says, <laughs> our sins and lawless deeds, it's, it's quoted in the Old Testament though, it says, our sins and lawless deeds he will not remember. You know, I love in Psalm 103 how it talks about, you know, he casts our sins as far as the east is from the west. So far he's removed our transgressions from us. You know, and when, we, when, he thinks, when, we, when we think about all the mistakes we've made in life and we think about the failures we've had and the times we've been disobedient to God and the years that we've spent going the wrong direction or the decisions we made that kind of took us down the wrong path and we think about all of those things 
And yet, you know who doesn't think about those things? God. Our sins and lawless deeds, He remembers no more. You know, if we confess our sins, He is faithful, means He always will. He is just, which means He legally can. Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, and so we have these times where we make mistakes and we spend maybe even years or decades even rebelling against God. And yet when it comes down to God looking at us and looking at our sin, it says our sins and lawless deeds, He remembers no more. He chooses to forget them. We remember them. The devil remembers them. But God has chosen to forget them. I love how it records it in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, 9, and 10. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promises, a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. It doesn't mention Jacob's house here. But if you notice, it doesn't mention a whole lot of disobedience of Abraham either, does it? You know, that's an interesting omission within the New Testament. It doesn't really talk about the sins of the people in the Old Testament. It's kind of wild. It doesn't talk about David's... It never mentions David and Bathsheba in the New Testament. It doesn't mention Abraham's obviously glaring mistake with Hagar. It says, he went to a land where God called him and by faith. And years went between the times of obedience and times of disobedience. And yet God does not remember them. It says, verse 10, for he waited, Abraham waited for a city which foundations whose builder and maker was God. You know, Abraham wouldn't dwell in a tent or wouldn't dwell in a house. And yet here his grandson Jacob does. It says, verse 18, Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, finally. And when he came to Padan Aram, he pitched his tent before the city. Now he's in Canaan. Again, eight to ten years in Succoth of wasted time. You know, we can do that. We can miss out on what God is calling us to by wasting a lot of time doing something else. And we can regret those things. But ultimately, God calls us, no matter how long we've spent away doing the wrong thing, God calls us back to obedience. And we don't want to miss out. In verse 19, And he, brought, he bought a parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. And this is where he will, um, he will bury Leah. And um, of course, he'll be buried there with her. He buys this ground. He digs a well. Um, we, find, we, we read about this well, actually, in John chapter 4. Woman by the well. This is the well that it's talking about. Do you know that well is still there today? If you go to um, Samaria, that well is still there. Verse 20, it says, Then he erected an altar there and called on El Eloi Israel, which is God, the God of Israel. Finally, you know, and, and so similar to Abraham. Remember, Abraham would find himself finally back in the will of God, finally in the land of Canaan again, after he'd go off to different places and try to, you know, go down to Egypt and, you know, get himself in trouble down there and come back. And, and finally, he would, when he was in obedience, when he, whenever he was in co- compliance, either back in the land or leaving behind his family that he was supposed to leave behind, um, God would meet him and he'd build an altar and worship the Lord. And, and, and so too um, with Jacob. Finally, um, after many mistakes and difficulties, never making it to Seir to see his brother, and who knows, maybe they visited each other in between. It doesn't tell us that. But finds himself in the land of Canaan finally where God's going to um, begin to establish him there um, before his children go to Egypt. So, that's the end of our chapter. That's all the time we have. We'll pray, and then I have time for a couple questions.